All right, we're live. At least that's what it tells me. <clears throat> so we got Reed Coverdell back. Um, sent out a bunch of stuff. I'm seriously ripping off your Twitter thing that, you know, if you subscribe, then I'll follow you on Twitter. <laughs> um, <laughs> so obviously Reed just got off work, um, but his beard game is doing much better than mine. Uh, I got a beard like a 14-year-old boy for some reason. So, um, yeah, we talked last time a little bit about education, things of that nature. I want to jump in with a, a pretty specific question that I, I kind of thought of last night. Um, why do people either fear or hate freedom? Um, I don't think they're looking at it as freedom. I think they're conditioned to think that um, that it's a threat. You know, it, they're not looking at it as freedom and as uh, the structure that exists as being something keeping them from freedom. They look at the structure that exists as protecting them. So my parents were not very protective in a lot of ways. They were in the sense that we weren't allowed to watch like bad movies growing up or whatever, but they would let us go play in the river without watching us when we were, you know, eight years old or whatever. <laughs> and they would, uh, <laughs> they'd let us, uh, my dad was, uh, he cleared a lot of land on, um, our property back in New Hampshire and he'd start big bonfires and he'd let us make little fires around the bonfires and throw stuff on the fires. He'd go inside. We'd be outside by the fires, you know, like when I was 16, to it. yeah, when I was 16, he'd uh, let me go with my friends, go backpacking for three or four days, a hundred miles from home. So, you know, to me, that was freedom. Um, mm -hmm. But to a lot of other kids, they were, you know, they were terrified, some of them at the prospect of like, whoa, you'd go 100 miles from your house? Well, you know, do you bring a, a GPS tracker with you or like, a, you know, <laughs> uh, or when we were younger, like when we'd go to the river and jump. Did you out. have a GPS tracker at that no. age? I don't know how old you are, but. <laughs> no, I'm 27. So that would have been in 2000. Oh, man, I got 10 years on you. Wow. Yeah. But uh, that would have been back in like 2010. When I was doing that, um, but still, like I didn't, they didn't have the type of stuff that. Uh, Back when a GPS tracker costs like a thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, to me, like freedom in a lot of ways was just kind of second nature. And I remember bringing more protected kids with me, and they were just terrified of everything. You know, like what's going to happen if this happens? I'd be like, it's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. You know, they were scared of bears. You know, in the woods in New Hampshire, it's like black bears, and you know they they don't eat they don't eat meat. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it's just like if you're brought up. Thinking, Wait, black bears don't eat meat. Well, they, you know, like squirrels sometimes are like, but they're not like carnivores. What they can scavenge, they're not. Yeah. They're not going to run you down. Mm, unless they're sick, pretty much. No. Oh, okay. Um, but I, uh, you know, so I. I viewed it as freedom, but a lot of kids who grew up in much more restrictive households, they were terrified at the prospect of not having protection all the time. So I think that's what it is. It's not so much that they hate freedom. It's just that they don't look at it as freedom. They look at as what exists as necessary protection. I think that's what it is. But Okay, well, that explains half of them. Half of them hate freedom. It seems like. I mean, it seems to me now... I'm not going to point fingers anywhere. I will say that I think what you described um, speaks to me a lot of Republicans, I guess, where they're maybe they just they're afraid of what could happen. And so mm -hmm. they don't see it as as that opportunity of freedom to go hiking, like you said. Um, but uh, there's another side to this equation that seems like they have a big problem with you having the freedom to do things um, to the point that I've, I've seen people say, um, well, if we all have to wear a mask, why isn't, why don't they have to wear a mask? And that's what I mean by that is that they seem to think that they have, I, I guess that if they feel oppressed, you should feel oppressed with them. Or if you refuse to play that particular game with them, then somehow you're oppressing them which I find odd because it seems to me like you hate freedom. 
Yeah, so that would be kind of like the parents of the kids who would see my parents let me do the stuff that they would let me do. Um, you know, you don't have to let your kids do the same thing. You have the freedom to uh, discipline them or keep them, you know, coddled to whatever degree you want. But when they'd see my parents let me do the stuff they do, they'd get angry sometimes. And sometimes they'd call, be like, I can't believe you're letting your kid do that. So maybe it's guilt almost, you know, it's like jealousy a little bit. Because I think some of those parents were like, man, you guys are like badass parents letting your kids do that. And I'm just too scared to let them do that. And so I won't let them do that. So that makes me upset that you're cooler than me. You know, it's kind of that complex of like, um, yeah, I I think it comes down to jealousy, you know, it, um, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. Like that mindset I've never really understood completely. Um, because it's just, well, I think that's because of the way you were raised. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So. So cool. Um, I, 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 I thought about that because, um, so I had, I guess the only version I would know of a viral tweet yesterday, and it's still going a little bit, um, where I simply tweeted out that maybe it's time for libertarians and anarchists to come together and buy a city. I meant to put buy or build. Yeah. I wound up with buy. Um, because either way, whether you buy it or you build it, it's non-aggressive. You're doing it of your own accord. Everyone's on the same page. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and for the most part, I mean, it was pretty, most people were, were, they liked the idea, you know, um, there were some, there was backlash. (laughs) There were some people that did not care for it at all. Um, they made it more than clear. They thought that I was a moron, which is fine. I don't care. You know, but um, my thinking in this is that it made me think, like, why do these people fear and or hate that that particular situation? Um, so I wanted to get your 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 thoughts on that. Um, so moving along here, I saw a story and I just want to get your thoughts on it because your father is a teacher and we did delve a little into education. Um, what are your thoughts? We currently have um separation of church and state you know that's what they call it whatever um and so schools aren't allowed i mean to a point now you're not even allowed to pray if you're a student in some schools you can be expelled for that um there is a district in california i won't name them because i want to give them any credence that it has been uh reported now i don't know 100 percent if it's true but it's been uh reported by a lot of different outlets that they are teaching the children there Mayan prayers to pray to the Mayan gods. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Uh, I believe in the separation of church and state. Um, So the fact that they're teaching, what what, what do you mean? Like in a historical sense or they're required? No, 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 no. They're saying it's for diversity. So in what are they, they're just requiring them to pray or? Yes. requiring them to do these Mayan chants and Mayan prayers. And they're saying that essentially what it comes down to is that because we were uh, founded on Judeo-Christian nation, that we didn't learn the religious whatever of these other nations. And so they're making them learn them. And I, I wouldn't have an issue if it was historically teaching them but they're having them do chants and pray. So is it in history class or are they just like- It's a diversity training. For every student, no matter what? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to hear more about the details, but I mean, the way you're describing it, it sounds pretty weird. I mean, I don't want them, if, if I'm required to send my kids to a public school, I don't want indoctrination of any religion, you know, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, you know, <laughs> I don't care what any it is. Of, any of the isms. I want them to learn about them. You know, I want them to sure. hear about them. But from but, a historical sense. Yeah, historical sense and a non-biased uh, learning sense, you know. And right, uh, right. so, it's I mean, your education. Yeah, that's my position on religion in schools. Like, I mean, if you want to go to a Christian school, then 
fine, pay for your kid to go to a Christian school or, a, you know, a, a Muslim school, whatever. Like that's, that's cool too. But in a public school, uh, if we're going to have public schools, then yeah, I mean, it shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't be pushing any religion on anybody in those schools. I don't think so. Right. I agree with that. Um, so I'm, you're from New Hampshire, so I'm sure you've heard of the New Hampshire free state project. Yep. What are you, what are your, your thoughts on that? as a whole? Um, I don't think it's very successful. Um, I, I like the idea. I think it's great. But, uh, you know, it depends on what you view as success. Like, we only have one state gun law, so that's pretty cool. Other than that, we just have to adhere to federal ones. But What is that gun law? It's something about, like, carrying a rifle on a four-wheel, on, on an ATV, like, in a state park or something. Or just some dumb some dumb law like or in your vehicle okay. in the state park or something uh, so obviously someone got shot or something and they made a law i mean who knows yeah. what it was but <laughs> um yeah. but you know even on guns we're behind other states like wyoming i believe doesn't follow federal gun laws they've they're just like fuck you we're gonna make to, our own. to a point um they they have to on national park land other than that no they don't yeah. they don't so, National park lands technically federal land, so on their own land, you know, they're they, they're they're ahead of New Hampshire, uh, and then like a Missouri, I think, is starting to say we're not going to follow federal gun laws anymore. Um, I think they just passed a thing that said that y you couldn't even enforce a federal gun law right. in that state. Then Oklahoma just, uh, I think, the Senate just passed a resolution to be se a Second Amendment sanctuary state. So. All that to say, like that, guns is probably the only thing New Hampshire can really brag about being free on. That and seat belts. We don't have to wear seat belts once you're over eighteen. I think we're the only. Which just state. seems like one of the most retarded things to focus on. Yeah, I mean, like, sure, I don't think you should have to wear a seat belt, but who cares? Like, it's so it's so irrelevant. Um, but you know, we're way behind on property. With that being said, you should wear your seat belt. Correct. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, like property taxes, we have insanely high property taxes. We like to brag about how we don't have a sales tax or a state income tax. Let me tell you, they make up for it in the property. <laughs> You're not saving any money. No. And in my opinion, I would rather have a sales tax than a property tax. Because, well, yeah, you can choose not to buy something. Yeah, exactly. Like you can be, you can be judicious with what you spend or buy. You should not be pro. You should. I mean, you shouldn't be taxed on anything, but you definitely shouldn't be taxed on your land that you own. I mean, that's bullshit. Like yeah. I, I would much rather go to a sales tax on a federal level too. Everything. Like I would much rather go to a sales tax to fund things than the way that it's funded now in New Hampshire. It's absolutely asinine. They have a view tax in New Hampshire. Like you get taxed more on your land if you have a nice view. Uh, and it's almost put people out of business because they've got beautiful views of the mountains or whatever, and they've, they've almost been put under, uh, you know, the drug. So, but who decides the nice view? How's that work? I don't actually really know because I've never lived on a piece of property that had a beautiful view. But I think it's, it's just assessed by the tax assessor, probably, right. you know, along with the value of your house and everything. Um, and then the drug laws are terrible. Like we're we're there's a circle around us, Maine. Vermont, Massachusetts, and Canada, you know, they've all got legal cannabis and we still don't. I mean, it's decriminalized now. So that's it's as far as much of a free state project. No. So, I mean, it, it's a joke. Like it's really not, it's, it's, I don't know. We, we have live free or die on our license plates and mm -hmm. we have one gun law, uh, but outside of, and you don't have to wear a seatbelt. Um, but outside of that, like it starts getting pretty, statist you know like it's not really that impressive uh you know it is very localized that's one good thing about new hampshire it's like mm -hmm. the largest so this is going to sound bad but it's actually good it's got it like the third largest government in the world but it's not centralized it's like spread out throughout all the towns like everybody votes on everything so it's very like representative government so it's actually it's very better. localized yeah so it's actually better than a lot of other forms. Uh, I mean, and actually, if you think about it, like the bigger government you have, if it's really decentralized, you're actually getting closer to anarchy because then you're having everybody involved with every decision right. that's going on, you know, in their own little town or whatever. 
Um, so that aspect is pretty good. But the other thing is like the state legislature is all boomers. That's why there's yeah. why the drug <laughs> I mean, because That's every state legislature. Yeah, but New Hampshire, I think all of them. You can't live off of being a state legislature in New Hampshire at all. Like that, you get like a hundred bucks a year or something stupid like that. I'm um, a big fan of that. But the problem is, only retired people can handle it because not a big fan of that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, I don't know. It's a catch twenty two. Hence the boomer thing. They're all retired. Exactly. I see. Okay. Um, well, that's interesting. I Like I said, I put that tweet out, and at some point, someone had tagged the, the Free State Project in it. And they did eventually, uh, sometime today, they had commented on it that they uh, that it was slow going, but they were making progress that I guess they said they had 20 to 25 percent of the state legislature now. In fact, the... Um, what do they call them? The speaker of the state legislature is now a free, a free state person or whatever, <clears throat> uh, presented a picture of them. But um, my thinking on that was that I looked into it a little bit. Uh, I wanted to get some research into it. I knew you were from New Hampshire. That's why I wanted to ask you. But I wanted to look into it. And it doesn't really seem to me like they've accomplished much at all. And, and part of my thinking, because a lot of people said, like one guy, I remember, um, I didn't comment on his, tweet, on his tweet, but he had said that um, someone had, had done that with a small state and, oh, wait, you know, because it hadn't really got anywhere. And my thinking on that was, well, you got to start small. You know, they might have just might have jumped the gun, might have went a little overboard. Maybe you prove it in a small scale and then you can expand it, you know, like a virus. And it would be a virus to the boomers. But um, anyway, I just wanted to, to, to touch on that with you. Um, I watched an episode you did uh, with, I'm probably going to butcher her last name, but Olivia Rondo. Yeah, Rondo. Rondo, okay. And um, there was a, a section of that conversation that made me like giggle quite a bit, actually. Um, because you two were discussing your Republican roots, essentially. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And the way you discussed it, and maybe it's just the way I heard it. That's probably what it was. But you sounded like you still are, are saddled with some of that. And, and I want to know, like, she was asking you about your, your journey from Republicanism to uh, Libertarianism to now you're you're pushing that threshold where you're like, I don't even care, you know, yeah. but one thing you guys both said was black pilled. Uh -huh. And I look at when you go anarchy, it's not black pilled. You haven't given up on people. You've just given up on any possibility that government is ever going to be changed. And I call that white build. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to maybe kind of dive into that a little more and, you know, I don't know, tell us what your thoughts are. Um, <clears throat> so I am pretty skeptical of American people in general. Um, I don't think getting rid of our government solves our problems. I think it gets rid of a lot of our problems, but I think Americans are really dumb. <laughs> I mean, they're just not, they're not <laughs> educated. They're selfish. They're, uh, they're simple minded. You know, they, I mean, I guess that's dumb the same word but they they jump to conclusions really quickly they don't know any philosophy they don't know any history they don't know the nuance of anything you know they they just they just need a little short 10 second clip and they're satisfied with their yeah, the whole story exactly and uh they don't arrive at conclusions through um evidence they arrive at a conclusion they want to be at and then they try to line their evidence that they find up with their preconceived conclusion, you know, so they sift through things. Oh, I don't like that bit of evidence. I'm going to keep that away from me. I don't like the sound of that. You know, um, I think to have a good society, you have to change people. You can't just get rid of the government. Like I, I do sport getting you rid you're of the change government. the culture kind of guy. You, gotta change the, you got to like, you've got to, yeah. you've got to get people to 
work together and trust each other and take care of each other and take care of themselves. You know, like self-reliance is not prevalent in the United States anymore. And it should be. Yes. And so the government definitely encourages that. But once you get rid of the government, you know, it, it, so, I mean, there's it's, the Rothbard button doesn't exist, right? We can't just hit a button and get rid of the government. The way that we're going to be able to phase out the government is by getting. Which I don't know that that would actually be the best idea. It might not, but uh, the the way that we're going to be able to phase government out slowly is by getting people to realize how unnecessary it is. And when you install government, I, I talked to Larry Sharp about this. When you install government, by default, you remove community. So what we got to do is bring community back, so that government becomes so obviously unnecessary. Um, <clears throat> so that uh, question about being black pilled. I mean, I am on the government, but also on the people right now. Like the people are fucking yeah. retarded, and they've got to. You know, they, sorry if I wasn't supposed to swear there, but uh, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. They've got to. Uh, they've got to figure the shit out, and they've got to uh, start reading history again and reading uh, philosophy and talking to each other and understanding economics and science and math. And I mean, we've just like thrown everything out the window and we wonder why the system's falling apart. Um, so yeah, I am a doomer on our government, but also on our society. Like I think our society <laughs> sucks and I think we need a 180. See, and I, I, I do my best to be optimistic about people, not about government. Government's always going to just try to grow. I feel like that's true. I think they've proven it forever. Mm -hmm. No matter what they're, you know, they're never satisfied. They need more and more and more. Um, but in this country, what, and I can see where you're coming from, what concerns me about it is the people empower the government. So it's people wanting government to take more and more. Or at least not fighting back. Not even to the point of, I don't care about the mask thing. That's not my biggest thing. You know, that's for whatever reason, a hill for some people. And that's weird to me. But um, <clears throat> it's, I, I okay, I'm going to rephrase. I have an issue with government mandates of it. I don't have an issue with the private business, mm -hmm. you know, requiring it. Um, right. But I guess... I have a little more faith in people. And I think the reason I do, and this was something you guys touched on. Actually, I believe you were talking to David fight, which I have him on tomorrow night oh. um, to discuss. Uh, but you guys had talked about um, policing in America. Mm -hmm. And with the, the Derek Chauvin uh, trial starting and everything, which by the way, I think the guy walks just saying, like I've looked at everything I can find, at least from a legal standpoint. And if he gets convicted, I'm pretty sure it's political. And that's basically it. Mm -hmm. um, personal opinion. But um, I don't remember which one of you made the point, but you had said that the COVID lockdowns had shifted a lot of the right wing opinion on police. And I actually think that's true. But I think your opinion of it was that's for now. Yeah. So, so go ahead. I'm sorry. That was actually with Olivia that we were talking about. Oh, that. my bad. Um, and I do want to uh, – I have more faith in the people than the government, just to clarify, because – I mean, I have no faith in either, but the government is just a few idiots with a lot more power instead of a lot of idiots with a little bit of power. I feel like the more, <laughs> the more decentralized the idiocy is, the less power it has. So you might as well have a bunch of idiots – competing against each other who are basically only in control themselves instead of a few idiots with a lot of control. That's, that's basically my philosophy there. Um, but yeah, uh, policing, um, I do think it's subjective. I think that MAGA only dislikes the cops when they're keeping them from getting into the Capitol building. And then as soon as that's over, you know, they'll love the cops again when they see them beating down some left wing protest in the streets a few months from now. I mean, it's just so shallow. Uh, both sides are just so shallow on everything. Um, 
you know, like this whole idea. Well, the left has actually cheered on the cops when they went after their enemy. Yeah, so that's uh, case of point right there. So the right is just going to do that again when the cops go after who they don't like. You know, this I, this narrative you hear that Trump made the Republicans anti-war, that's f- that's bullshit. He did not. I mean, uh, when you when he airstriked Soleimani um, and it looked like we were going to war with Iran, you know, the Republicans were beating the war drums, like all of them except oh, no. for two or three of them in Congress. And then all the voters I know were just ready to go, ready to go. Um, and it just proved to me, like, it's all subjective. You guys two weeks ago were saying you want to end the endless wars because that's what Trump was saying. But as soon as he bombs someone and says, okay, we're going in, then you're all for it. Like, it doesn't matter. There's been no psychological switch in anyone's minds. It's just, what is my team doing? What is the other team doing? Um, how, who's in charge? That, that's all that matters. So I don't, you know, I don't think the right is waking up to police power you know i don't think so <laughs> so it's a cult yeah on both sides it's basically a cult yeah that's and all it is. Yeah. um i remember when i was growing up and again uh, we've established i'm 10 years older than you um about to be 11 years older than you next month anyway um the there were there were a lot of things the right and left had in common uh kind of like now The difference was where they had common ground, very often they would find that common ground and kind of work together to try to deal with whatever particular issue was going on. The the right was always like very pro-cop, pro-military, pro all that stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. The left was at least seemingly a little more hesitant towards that. Um, Sometimes. now, Now, even when they agree, they don't work together. They refuse, you know, um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but uh, AOC had tweeted something out. Ted Cruz said, you know, hey, I'd work with you on that. She said, hey, you tried to have me murdered or something. And I'm like, what is happening? You know, Um, is there a bridge in government, in your opinion, um, where that shit stops and they they can knock it off? Is there anyone in government, I should say, Joe Biden's not the guy, I know that, but is there anyone currently seated anywhere that can say, knock it off, we have real problems we need to focus on, um, stop saying the other one tried to have you murdered? It, just, is that is that real? I mean, is there anyone, in your opinion? So to me, that is all optics still, all the... The, the 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 screeching at each other. I mean, if you look at the important bills, look at how people vote and they still get along pretty well on certain issues, you know, like that. Uh, the, the prime example of that was that stimulus bill that passed right before Christmas. Um, you know, 59 right. people voted against it. And then we're supposed to think that the Democrats and Republicans are diametrically opposed. 59 in the House. 59 yeah. in the house. No, 59 altogether. It was, uh, Total? yeah, 50. Oh my God. It was six Republicans in the Senate and 52. Um, I don't know, Mix 50, and matches. It was 50 Republicans, two Democrats, and then Justin Amash in the house. <laughs> so it was 59 wow. out of 538. So you yeah. had Bernie Sanders and Dan Crenshaw on the same side of that. You had AOC and uh tom cotton on the same side of that you know so all these people that supposedly didn't just, elon omar vote against that one too no it was just rashida to leave and tulsi Gabbard. oh rashida to leave. okay i knew it was one of those i i can i always mix up the four of them yeah they're, they're interchangeable they're the <laughs> they're all it's like almost like they they play tag on whose turn it is yeah i know <laughs> the squad um yeah. but uh you know we're supposed to but they all came together right What's that? The, the, they all came together, Republicans, Democrats, they all came together to spend, to burn uh, money because that's what they're doing. Yeah. So they, there still is a wide bipartisan consensus to do certain things, you know, go to war, spend money, expand the power of the government. Most people fall in line for that every single time. 
Um, but they have to keep the optics up that they hate each other. Uh, so that's what they do. Um, you know, as far as people who work together on good things, um, I'm going to give this to Rand Paul. He does that a lot. Like he across the aisle, he's worked with Kamala Harris and, uh, he's worked with like Cory Booker. Uh, he's worked with people in the house. He's worked with AOC. He's, I mean, he, he is a very bipartisan legislator. Um, the thing is like, he's giving into the polarization right now. Like he's, um, you know, he's just talking about how horrible the Democrats are and how they want to defund the police and they're communists or whatever, you know, when they're, <laughs> when they're really just the same <laughs> Republicans. But, uh, he, uh, <laughs> He's someone who has done a lot of bipartisan legislating. Uh, Thomas Massey is another good one. Thomas uh, Massey is my favorite person in both houses of the the Congress and, and all of the federal government. Thomas yeah. Massey is the only one I actually trust. Well, yeah. I do trust Rand Paul. I mm, I don't know if I trust well, Rand Paul anymore. <laughs> you, you said something uh, on Olivia's show that, that struck a uh, nerve in me. And it's the same thing that, well, I guess you just pointed it out, but it's, it put words to what my issue I've always had with Rand Paul, which is his rhetoric doesn't match his voting record. Right. In the his voting record is very good, yeah. but his rhetoric is like, what are you doing? Which is the opposite problem of most people. Most people <laughs> have <true>. great <laughs> rhetoric and then their voting record sucks. It's, it's yeah. really weird with him. He's the other way. Um, yeah, he's he's interesting. Um, the other guy is uh, Pete Mayer, uh, Justin. I, I like Pete. I, I do like that guy. He's uh, I actually like him more than Rand Paul right now. <laughs> I would I would go. Well, yeah, but you you have a love hate thing with Rand Paul that most people don't have. <laughs> yeah, so. So, I mean, like, you guys got to remember, Rand is who brought me in in the beginning. Right? Yeah, I mean, he's like the godfather of my libertarian becoming you know so yeah. like a lot of people are like that with bernie sanders on the left you know they bernie inspired them and they're like actual hardcore progressive socialists which bernie is not isn't he's a corporate sellout he's a hack yeah. so that you know you see a lot of bernie supporters who hate bernie now they're just like who are you yeah so that's kind of how i am with rand but i just realized rand is better than bernie because at least he votes well bernie Bernie's a sellout in his rhetoric and in his voting record. Like he shills for the Democrats and votes for them. You know, Rand at least just shills for the Republicans. He doesn't vote with them. Yeah. So, you know, that makes him a little bit better. But yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, as far as, well, I agree with you. There's, there's, to me, there's very few and less now. Um, I didn't always agree with Justin Amash, but I thought he was an honest person that was looking out for what he felt was the best interest of his constituency yep. and the American people. Uh, I had the same feeling with Tulsi Gabbard, mm -hmm. which is why I said uh, in our first uh, conversation that if I would have been put in a position to choose, I would have chose Tulsi mm -hmm. because, um, and you actually, you actually lent uh, words to, to my argument with Tulsi was that the things she had the power to do, she was really good on. Right. And the things she didn't have the power to do, she didn't have the power to do. So I don't care. Yeah, like, exactly. It's fine. And so I would have chose her, you know, yeah. uh, I thought your argument on that was brilliant, by the way. Um, <clears throat> but out of all of them, Thomas Massey uh, is my favorite as far as just, I think he's just such a good, honest person. Um, and he, he practices what the Democrats preach, which I find hilarious. I don't know if you ever saw the documentary, but his house is all run on solar. Oh, it's a Tesla. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he practices what they preach. Um, but I knew that I really liked Thomas Massey uh, when the CARES Act was being passed. Oh, yeah. That was and he said, hey, you, you people have to come to work to vote, you know. And he got hit by both sides. I was oh, like, yeah. okay, you know. My problem is, is that he's never going to, I don't think he'll ever have the status to try to, to reach to a higher a reign. But I, I see him kind of as Ron Paul like more than Rand Paul. And oh, that's yeah. really irritating <laughs> yeah. to me. 
that just irks me. I don't know why. Yeah, no, um, he, he is. He's more like Ron than Rand is. Rand, yeah. It, um, and I, I love Massey. I don't think he'll ever run for president or even want to be a senator. Like, I think he's at the top of where he'd ever want to get to. So <laughs> I honestly think he's probably almost done. Yeah. Or he's just going to go on and do other things, you know. Yeah. I think he's going to pull a Justin Amash and be like, all right, we're out of uh, – it. we're done. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I got a question for you. Do, you. do you agree with what I said on Olivia's show that Justin Amash might not run for president? Like, I have always – I've thought for, like, a year that he'd run in four years. But after watching – I don't know if you saw his show with Michael Malice. I was like – I did. Dang, maybe this guy's not gonna run. <laughs> That's that was my takeaway. But um, I think he'd have to get prodded pretty hard by people to do yeah. it. I, I agreed with you. I don't think that he will. Uh, I got that same impression. Yeah. Um, and of well, see, here's the thing: you never know who's gonna run. You know, so you don't know who will show up to the to the party, so to speak. Um, of I don't think that he will. I, I I don't think that he will. And I don't think even if he did, it would do much. I don't think he would stand too much. He might be able to get a little something going and, and get a message across, but I don't think he would make it. And I think it's because it's too polarized right now. I, I don't think, you know how they, that, that term, uh, it's always darkest before the dawn. Yeah. We're not even close to the darkest and Biden's not the darkest. Yeah, right. You know, that's what I'm concerned about. So someone like Justin Amash, who would be leaps and bounds better than the last four or five people. Mm -hmm. um, he, I, I don't think he will. I kind of hope that he does, because it would be interesting to see what he had to say on a national scale. Um, yeah. I don't think that he will. I think he would do better than anyone else has. I think he would. Yeah, you know, I can see him getting on the debates if they didn't just keep raising. They'll just they'll just say, "Oh, you need thirty percent. You need forty. You know, that's what'll happen." And that's what they do. That's what they do. Yeah, <laughs> I hate that part because I'm like, you know, um, <clears throat> that was one of the things that um, I, I think Ron Paul actually caused a lot of that. Honestly, if you if you look historically at their their reasoning behind things and oh you got to have this much in the polls or you got to do that or whatever nonsense rules they came up with uh ron paul caused it because they would make these arbitrary numbers he'd reach them they'd have to let him on the stage he'd make everyone look dumb and of course the mainstream and you know the i guess quote unquote deep state is like we cannot let this terrible terrible person take away all our power yeah um now, Gary Johnson got the tail end of that, in my opinion, where they hadn't changed the rules enough yet. And so Gary Johnson got on a couple stages uh, and just didn't. Uh, he just didn't do well. No, um, didn't. And then Joe Jorgensen just never got on the, the stages. Like she just wasn't there, um, which might or might not be good for her, honestly. Yeah. So I think that 1% could have turned into half percent if they let her talk. <laughs> I think she was better than uh, Gary Johnson, to be honest. Like I do too. I do too. On her policies and stuff, I do. I do. Well, even like her eloquence, like she's a burnt piece of toast. She's super boring, but yep. she actually knew what she was talking about for the most part. Right, but the the thing is, is boredom will turn people off more than anything. Yeah. Uh, and so if you're boring, you're done. You know, I think yeah. that was a lot of Gary Johnson's problem. He bored me too. You know, <laughs> Ron Paul could get you fired up. Oh man, yeah. You know, he could get you fired up or you're like, yeah, we're going to march on the Capitol or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. He had that that power to him. And uh, I don't know. Um, you know, um, you did an episode. I can't remember if it was on your show or where it was, but I saw you were on it. And it was uh, uh, you had Dave Smith and. Oh, yeah. David. Fight yeah. And Jeremy yeah. Fight. Yeah. Dave fight. David. Dave Smith and then Jeremy. I'm, I don't know the other one. Yeah, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, and you guys were having a conversation about <clears throat> just the way that 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 party's going. And I, one thing I wanted to ask you, um, Dave Smith. I think I think he genuinely is trying to look for someone that brings that 
je ne sais quoi that Ron Paul had, right? Yeah. That power, that force that Ron Paul had. Uh, that's a large, large thing to look for. Uh, it's going to be difficult to find one. As you said, you thought maybe Rand Paul was that guy in 2014. After you learned about his father, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, well, I did follow his dad in 2012. Okay. Um, you know, I was a senior in high school, and I would have voted for him. He, he, the primary in New Hampshire was before my birthday, so I, I wasn't. Oh. But I, I remember I would have voted for him. I told other people to vote for him. Uh, so I was paying attention to him. I knew who he was. I just wasn't a libertarian yet. Rand Paul is the guy who, like, brought that me pulled in. in. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, to my point, I think – and I genuinely think that what Dave Smith is doing is genuinely looking for the next Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? Is he the next Ron Paul? I don't think we have another Ron Paul because uh, Ron, think about Ron Paul. Veteran, mm -hmm. 20 years in office with an impeccable voting record. Impeccable. I've went through it. <laughs> I know. It's amazing. Um, inspirational speaker, mm -hmm. um, guy who just knows like monetary policy, like the back of his hand. Um, I don't, we don't have that. Like Dave so Smith, is gone. I mean, we, I, you know, unless you can, <laughs> uh, I don't know, unless you can do a brain transplant with Tulsi Gabbard. Or something, you know, like, <laughs> well, I but what, I, what I meant by next Ron Paul is someone with that same force, that same power that he had, that that intellect that is incapable to reach for most people, you know? Yeah. I mean, I like Dave Smith. I will certainly vote for him if he's the nominee. And, uh, you know, I, I'm friends with him. Uh, I think he's a great guy. Um I don't know. Like, I want to – he has – I mean, he's been a comedian, and he's been kind of a shit poster, and he drags people who disagree with him on everything. I've been it's seeing – problem. <laughs> he's maturing. Like, he's been maturing over the last few months <clears throat> intentionally, mostly because we kind of called him out on it. I don't know. You, that was what that video that you were referencing was about, actually. It was the right. libertarian unity thing. Um you know, if he can, if he can prove that he's the guy, that would be great. But I think he's got a ways to go. Like he's got to, uh, he's got to prove that he's a voice for liberty, not for himself. You know, like not right. just for his own version of liberty. That he's going to represent a broad group of people because that's what Ron Paul was. Ron Paul was not exclusionary and he didn't drag people who disagreed with him. He was like best friends with Dennis Kucinich and he said yeah. he would put Dennis Kucinich in his And cabinet. Ralph Nader. And Ralph Nader. And Dennis Kucinich, when he ran, he said he'd choose Ron Paul as his running mate, maybe. You know, so like, yeah, this whole idea that like we, those icky progressives or those icky conservatives, you know, like that's yeah, I just what, don't feel that way about them. Yeah, I mean, Ron Paul was very open armed to everybody who cared about liberty. Mm -hmm. So I, I think Dave, you know, it'll be interesting to see what he does. I don't know. Like I'm Well, I'm, I don't think that I don't think he's ever even expressed that he would be interested in that side of things. I was just looking at it from this from the process that uh say anything you want about him and trust me, plenty of people tell me plenty about him, uh that I'm like, okay, well, obviously you either don't really follow him or you don't follow him enough to know. I yeah. think they just see the shit posting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but the thing is, is that one thing I will give him is he is putting in a lot of work to try to do his Mises caucus takeover or whatever. And um, I don't know really when it comes to the caucuses in the libertarian party, I don't care. Like whatever. There's like 15,000 of them or something. I don't even know. Yeah. Like it's hard to keep track of what's going on there, but um, he, he has a plan and anyone with a plan is better off than people that just want to argue with each other. In my yeah. opinion. Um, uh, and he seems like a pretty good guy. Like mm -hmm. overall, he's, yeah. he seems honest about what it is he believes. So I, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, now we're going to delve into something that's just terrible, and I hate this conversation, but we got to do it because we got you on the program. Um, 
I saw, and I've seen it a lot lately, that you can't be anarchist or libertarian and religious, or you can't be anarchist, libertarian, and pro-life. Thoughts? Uh, I mean, I don't see why you can't be an anarchist, religious person. I mean, it. I don't really get that. I, I don't understand what that means. <laughs> uh, I, I don't either, because to me, religion and church are not the same thing. The, the way it got presented to me by one woman was that uh, governments are built on religion. Uh, and so you couldn't support religious beliefs and be an anarchist. No, I think you've, I mean, you voluntarily join a religion, right? That's a voluntary yeah. choice. I'm an atheist. That's a voluntary. Well, see, it's not a. It's not a psychologically voluntary choice. If you actually believe what you're saying, that's not a decision you've made. That's happened beyond your control, right? Like you can't. Mm -hmm. um, Subconscious. Yeah. Like I can't decide to believe in Jesus again right now. I can't just be like, okay, I believe in Jesus, you know, because I'd be right. lying. It would be like, okay, I'm going to decide to believe in Santa Claus again. Like I can't just make myself believe that. Hey, but, what do you mean? Santa Claus isn't real? Uh, just forget it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, as far as like, if you're going to be part of an organized religion and go to church and everything, that's completely voluntary. So I don't see why you couldn't have churches and organizations and anarchist society. I don't see why not. Um, right. Pro-life. Like, what does that mean? Uh, Anti-abortion, you know, they, they they basically say that if you're, some of the argument I, and blowback I've got from people is, so I, <clears throat> abortion would probably be my number one struggle. And it, and it comes down to, because I am religious, uh -huh. um, is that I believe <laughs> life, life begins at conception. I also believe that if we found a germ on Mars, we would call it life. And yeah. so the, the scientific side of that is odd to me, how we make these arguments. But... Um, I just, that's how I believe. And so I don't like abortion, yeah. but I don't know where, where it becomes, you know? And so basically my ideology is heartbeat. If there's a heartbeat, um, I have an issue with this because you're not, I guess I look at it that you made a choice. You chose wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so they say that you can't be, anarchist or libertarian and and uh pro-life or or anti-abortion or whatever and i disagree with that argument because my argument is you're not harming yourself you're harming another yeah so i am pretty pro-life myself <clears throat> i don't think that banning abortion solves the problem i mean i, I no, no no i don't either so i mean i don't see how you can't be an anarchist to be pro-life like if you if you want some sort of Leviathan state to regulate abortion and to come after, you know, to be, I mean, I don't even know how you keep track of abortion necessarily, necessarily from a status perspective, but yeah, I mean, as an anarch, I'm pro, I'm pretty pro-life. Like I, um, you know, I, I would say like after the first trimester, I, I would think it would be wrong to have an abortion. Um, you know, that's pretty early, but I, I don't know, like the first trimester is three months, you know, that's yeah. a bit of time. That's plenty of time to take care of it. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm for full access to contraceptives. I'm for people getting sex education so they know what they're doing. Um, you know, I think the, the shame of um, premarital sex is something that actually causes a lot of abortions because people are terrified to admit that they've had sex outside of wedlock in religious communities. You know, I think that's a big, is that as bad now as it was say when even you were growing up or when I was, I mean, we, you know, we got oh, 10 years, but it's not as bad, but I mean, in the South, you know, it's still there. It's still, it's still there. there. Yeah. I'm, if you look at the statistics, Protestant women are the number one, uh, the number one group who have abortions, you know, it's, I didn't know that. 
Yeah. And that, I think that's a big factor is the shame, you know? Um, and, and also the fact that some of these people think contraceptives are evil, you know, so they don't use them and then they get, yeah, yeah. uh, those are mostly religious people. Yeah. So, you know, I think, uh, there's a lot of reforms we can make to prevent abortions. I don't really believe in the status solution of just like banning them because just like banning drugs or. Gun- well, the problem is right now the status aren't, I mean, there are status that want to ban them, but the other status are like. Pay for them. Yeah. <laughs> they're going the other direction. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, you know, what was it? I don't remember which governor it was, but they had said after it was born, they'd have a discussion with the doctor. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like yeah. now you're, that's not, we're not even on, you know, I don't know. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's, I'm with you, man. That one's, that's always rough. You always run into it. And, and I found myself running into that a lot. Um, which I don't understand, but okay. Uh, Mo Rhodes. That was the number one thing. That's the number one meme, right? With libertarians, mm-hmm. anarchists. Mo Rhodes, how are you going to build a road? Would you please explain to these nut bags how roads get built without a state forcing or, or forcefully taking money from you to build a crappy road that they don't maintain? Well, most roads aren't built by the state. You know, they they hire private companies. So all the state is, is a middleman. I mean, if you, you know, the highway department itself does mostly maintenance. They don't really, they never build the roads or repave the roads. It's private companies that the state hires out. So all you're doing is creating a middleman to pay for your road. You just cause an extra cost, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. Here's the argument I get. Yeah. How do you get the entire neighborhood to pay for the road? You got to go, you know, they're like, they're not going to because they're going to say, I don't care if there's a pothole, right? It's not in front of my house, so I don't care. So um, I think, I don't know. I I don't know if Michael Malice came up with the word, but it's one of my favorite words, midwits. You know, they understand how a road gets built, but they don't understand anything other than that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so I had, I had mentioned on Twitter, like I said, about buying or building a city, mm-hmm. which is something I'm really actually looking into. I'm, I'm like really considering that I think it's possible. I think we could pull it <laughs> off if we wanted to. Um, how do the roads get built? Like how, how can you, in, in layman's terms that the midwits can understand, how would one make sure that those roads not only got built, but also stayed maintained? So basically what you have to replace is the middleman who's collecting the money, right? Mm-hmm. Because the, um, you know, the as I said, the actual construction of the roads is done by private companies mostly anyway. So all you have to figure out is how you're getting the money to the private companies from you to the road. So, you know, some libertarians are just autistic and they don't understand that, you know, you still have to pay for things in an anarchist society. Mm -hmm. Um, People who actually think about this stuff actually get it. But a lot of libertarians are just like, oh, no taxes. I could just live and everything's going to fall into place. It's like, well, no, you still have to to pay for things. Um, So, you know, like, I think direct payments for use make a lot more sense than a general tax that's then distributed. So if you have, uh, do you know Dan Berman, Dan Taxation Theft Berman? Uh, Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, A little bit. I've, I've, I've seen some of the work, yeah. I had him on my show and we talked about this. And he was saying, you know, if you're someone who doesn't own a car and you live out in the woods... You know, you shouldn't have to pay for the roads. You should have to pay. One hundred percent right. Yeah. So you should have to pay for the roads if you're using the road, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, whether it's a toll or it's through like registration of your vehicle for going on that road, you know, just different forms of direct payment for use instead Mm -hmm. of 
oh, we're going to tax this much of your income every year. And then we're going to send this much to the road, this much to the library, this much to the fire department. How about each of those services? If you want those services, you pay for them. So right. if you pay want, yeah, if you want the fire department to come to your house, if you have a fire, then you pay a fee to the fire department every month. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, this is what voluntary taxation looks like, right? Like it's direct payments to services that you choose you want. Instead of the government coming and taking a section of your income and throwing you in prison if you don't. And, you know, then you have no decision over where your taxes are going. If it's 100% voluntary funds coming from you to whatever services you need, that's how it would work. And so that's how the roads would work, you know? So if you, um, if you want to go on a road, you pay a toll. Um, mm -hmm. you, um, you know, it, it would be a lot more like utilities, the way utilities are set up. Like utilities, if you don't want electricity at your house, then you just don't get it. If you don't no, want- Well, that's actually not entirely true. Where? There is, um, there are, I, I, I actually just, just recently watched a documentary about um, multiple people that have went to jail because they uh, they take they took themselves off the grid. Oh, they, okay. well, they were able to do their own thing, and yeah. so they said, "I don't want that." And they said, "No, you have to be connected." And they're like, "Well, I don't want to be connected because then I have to pay to be connected." And they're like, "Doesn't matter. You have to do it." And they said, "No," and they went to jail. Okay, well, that's bullshit. That shouldn't happen. But for the most part, like if you don't pay your electric bill, it just comes shut well, off. Well, they turn it off. <laughs> so that's, exactly. Yeah. So that's how it would be. Like you choose which services you want, which services you need, mm -hmm. and that's how you, things would be funded in a, in a, a stateless society. So right, and you can have your roads mm -hmm. if that's what you decide to have. Yeah. Or you know, figure out how to do it. Like. That's the thing that's that's one of the memes that never made sense to me. And primarily it's because New York City had roads before they had taxes. Right. I, that was not a, a thing they had an issue with. Somehow they managed to pull it off. You know, they got roads. Um, Another guy so, who's like really smart on this is Larry Sharp. He talks yeah. about like privately or corporately owned roads or corporately owned bridges. Yeah, uh, when he was running for governor, I remember seeing yeah. him on, I think, Rogan. And he was talking about Pepsi or whatever can, like, uh, pay to have their their name on the bridge, you know. Instead of the Cuomo Bridge, it'd be the Pepsi-Cola Bridge or whatever. Yeah, I think those I thought that was a good idea. Yeah, I love that. I mean, why not? You don't have to pay a toll anymore. You don't have to pay taxes to subsidize the bridge. Pepsi they put this the stupid bridge. thing on, on arenas. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> which are also heavily subsidized. Um, and that was uh, something I wanted to ask you about too. Um, a lot of people, as we were discussing right in the beginning, that people, you you explained it pretty well, I thought, that it's not necessarily a fear of freedom. It's they don't understand, you know, the difference. Um, government, and, and this is something I struggle with trying to explain to people. They take your money, they take your property taxes, they sucker you into signing these stupid bonds or voting for these dumb bonds wherever you live, you know. Uh, the majority of local uh, spending or, or infrastructure tax raising comes from bonds. It's not like, you know, they don't, they'll raise sales tax here and there, but whatever. Um, they build these stupid arenas all over, you know, these sports arenas. They then somehow become privately owned by the individual that owns the franchise. And people are none the wiser that you're paying $8 for a hot dog in, <laughs> in an arena you built, like with your own money. Yeah. So what, the, how, I don't even understand. How are people that dumb, honestly? I don't know, man. It's, that's, it's textbook fascism is what it is, is when your tax money is subsidizing billionaires. I mean, that's pretty much fascism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like, mean, I don't get that. Yeah, uh, everyone <laughs> likes to call it communism, but it's like, well, or socialism. It's like, well, hey, 
we don't own the means of the production. It's still the rich. We're just <laughs> paying for it for them. That's that's fascism, you know. Um, you're totally right, though. Yeah, that is like so ironic. Um, I mean, I think people just don't know. I really think that's what it is. I think if people actually knew where all this money was going, how much we subsidize, I think there would be a revolution. I mean, even with yeah dim-witted, stupid fucking Americans. Like, there still would be a revolution. They'd just be like, what? No way. You know, they, they just have no uh, idea. I, I think you, you brought it up on uh, one of your shows the other night that uh, I you have a buddy that went through this latest um, uh, stimulus nonsense. They did this $2 trillion monstrosity and he's like, I can only account for like a trillion of it. And you said something about they bury stuff and like there will be like one sentence where it's like, oh, and this gets seven hundred million dollars. And, it's mm -hmm. you know, they do it on purpose. So you can't you don't know what's going on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's funny seeing the Republicans freak out about this monstrosity of a one point nine trillion dollar bill that's seven hundred pages long. <laughs> hey, <laughs> When you guys were in charge, we passed a two point four trillion dollar bill that was fifty five hundred pages long, and then mm -hmm. a two point seven trillion dollar bill, you know, seven or eight months earlier that was the the I mean it was the same. I, I think it was like nineteen hundred pages. Yeah. So it's like shut up, you guys. <laughs> like you're yeah. So, what well, was funny to me, and I want to ask you about this. Um, HR eight. Okay. That was a bill that just passed through the House of Representatives. Chuck Schumer says he's going to bring it up in the Senate. Uh, it's the the gun background check expansion thing, right? Yeah. The bill's eight pages. It's eight pages. Yeah. One of the number one things I've heard most of my life when I could, because honestly, since I was like 13, I was like, why is this so many pages? Like they established a country in like a nightclub somewhere in the 17th century, you know, on like a couple pieces of parchment. Uh -huh. And now we can't do anything without hundreds or thousands of pages of, of garbage. Um, and I, my entire life, it's like, well, that's just the way it works. They have to negotiate. Right. And there's a lot of language and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I remember the CARES Act. I remember a lot of people going, why can't you just send us money? Now, I disagree with just sending people money. I think that's retarded. But I do understand their concept of how can this thing not just be a paragraph? You know what I mean? Yeah. If you're going to send it to us and we don't have to pay it back, if that's one, that's a sentence. You know what I mean? Send everyone this much money, done. Pass it. You're good. Whatever. Uh, and a lot of the argument then was, well, they got to go back and forth. They got to negotiate, whatever. Well, HR8 is eight pages. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that just prove that they're full of it? Yeah. And I, I would say, like, you know, if we are going to spend all this money, I would much prefer just direct cash payments. I mean, six trillion dollars. Someone did the math the other day. We all would have forty five thousand dollars stimulus check. Forty. $44,284. Yeah. I mean, think of how much further that would have gone than what we've done. <laughs> like, Well, they yeah. would have kept the small businesses alive just by spending the money there. Yeah. The businesses, no one would have gotten evicted. Um, you know, if, if you, you could have stayed home if you had to. Well, my understanding is most people haven't been evicted, but they're going to be. Right. But we could have avoided that. Like this whole... Mm -hmm moratorium on rent like how does that solve anything whereas if you're sending money to people at least they can pay their rent so the, you know the system's still working you, you've got inflation, which is going to be an issue no matter what if you're right money but at least but now we're going to have inflation and all this rent garbage on top of everything you know it's going to be rent super mortgage all this these oh, people God. that are tens of thousands of dollars behind or they're done they're in the street man yeah, I'm gonna have Liberty. You know, I'm gonna have Clint from Liberty Lockdown on uh, next week. So oh, he's good. Yeah, I like we'll talking yeah. about that. So that'll be interesting. But cool. Um, so uh, maybe just two more. Um, well, I was actually gonna bring up the the whole stimulus nonsense and everything they've done. Uh, so we'll just do this last one. So okay. this last one, I 
I don't know all the details. I know some of them. I know that uh, they they did a weird thing with the child tax credit and the tax bill where people are going to get money each month mm -hmm. deposited. It's not it's not a credit they'll claim at the, the next time they file. They'll just get it in their account, whatever, if they have a certain amount of children. Right. I'm actually with you. I'm more a fan of that because it's just direct. You know what I mean? Like they can yep. do something with it. Um, but, uh, so everyone, I guess if you're just a single, we'll go with that. You're supposed to get 1400 bucks. What should they do with their $1,400? What would be your, your thought process on that? Like, how would you tell them to use that? Well, it kind of depends on what your situation is, but, uh, for me, I'm actually going to invest in Bitcoin and I've been, uh, I've been holding back on this for a while because I, I listen to no Peter. financial advice on this channel. Just yeah, so just, everyone's clear. He's not giving you financial advice. He's saying correct. his opinion. Yeah. Um, I, I listen to Peter Schiff a lot and I really bought into his criticisms of Bitcoin for a while. Yeah, that was a mistake. I made a bunch of money on Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make it. I made some money on silver, but not on gold so much. Um mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Bitcoin, it, it seems like it's the way to go for now, at least that might change. But, uh, you know, I was afraid to buy it at 30,000 and 40,000 and 50,000. So, so you're going to buy it at 60. I'm just going to buy it and, you know, might as well. And if, if nothing else, it's uh, even if it doesn't turn out to be a great investment, it's bucking the system. It's trying to take down the yeah. central banking dollar system that we have. So might as well. That's what I'm going to do with it. So. Well, I saw a, uh, a article today that said 115 new corporate U.S. corporations uh, by the, I believe, July of this year will accept Bitcoin as currency in their locations. Yeah. Um, so, and and I mean, all you have to do is look at the headlines, look at the way the Treasury <coughs> Department's handling Bitcoin. They're terrified. They don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, as much as I might despise Ben Shapiro on most issues, he he did this. I don't know if you saw this dumb little like 14 minute thing where he explained Bitcoin and fiat currency. And he did a really good job at it. Like yeah. he really did explain it pretty well. It's all about faith, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I like that you brought up Peter Schiff because he's not wrong about gold and stuff, except one of the things that I've always thought about, and I've even said this to to friends and, and uh, well, basically anyone that would listen, is that Bitcoin has the same value as gold in a collapse. None. It doesn't mean anything. Um, I raise chickens and I raise pigs and stuff, right, on my property. Uh, if you come to me and say, I'll give you these Bitcoin for some of your pigs, I'm going to be like, get the hell out of here. Where's my coffee? Yeah. No. You know what I mean? Because that's what it's, that's really it. And so I get myself in trouble because I tell people, yeah, sure, invest and, and get things, but also try to get property because property you can grow food and food can sustain you, you know? Yeah. No. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Final question. This will be fun. I have David fight tomorrow night. We're going to, yeah. we're going to talk. What's the easiest way to get him fired up so he goes off in one of his little rants, <laughs> which are hilarious? Uh, easiest way to get David fight fired up. Hmm. Um. Boy, that's a tough one. I'm trying to think. Um. <laughs> you can tell him. Um. I don't know. Try to defend the police somehow. Say something about how uh, <laughs> you know, people who were brutalized by the police, they just should have done what they were told or something like oh, that. Oh, they deserved it. Or something. Just, just follow the law. Yeah. Just follow the law. Something like that. Okay. That's probably his. That's that's how I see him get triggered the most. And, really? Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> That's that's his pressure point. Okay. That's pressure point. <laughs> All right, Reed, man, I really appreciate it, uh, and we'll have to do it again sometime. I mean, yeah, for sure. I wasn't on your list last time. Eventually, I'm going to make your list. I'm going to be one of those guys you want to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me on, man. 
All right, man. I got uh, um, your YouTube channel and your Twitter. Is there anything else you want to tell the people about? Anything you got coming up? Uh, yeah, I got Dave Smith coming on the show tomorrow night at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. So tune in for that. I'll be posting a link to Twitter. It's going to be that live. Is that going to be live or just – yeah, it's live? Okay. It's, uh, as long as I – it, it kind of depends on my work schedule, but as long as uh, everything falls together, I'll be, uh, I'll be live with Dave Smith tomorrow at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. All right, you heard it that you know the libertarian Tupac on Reed Coverdell's channel, the Naturalist Capitalist. All right, thanks, Reed, man. I really appreciate it. All right, man. Thank you. You have a good one. You too.